Welcome to Renolda Church. We are so glad you're here. Take just a moment to fill out the Connect card you received when you arrived. It only takes just a moment to let us know how we can pray for you and your loved ones this week. We are a big church family meeting in four locations throughout the Piedmont Triad, and the Connect card is a great way to help us stay in touch across all of our campuses. Starting the new year is one of the most exciting times here at Renolda Church because it means our blessing service is just right around the corner. What is the blessing service, you might ask? Well, it's a time when we gather together and receive a personal blessing from our church leaders. That is a positive, faith-filled vision spoken over our lives. Blessing is the fuel God uses to move us forward on the path He has destined for us. He blesses us because He loves us. So, instead of making New Year's resolutions that are destined to fail, bring your family to the blessing service and get your new year started off on the right foot. Use the handy link below to explore times and locations. Your year-end gifts are vital to the continued mission of Renolda Church. More than ever, people are looking for an answer, and we have it. The answer is, and will always be, Jesus. Every gift is an investment in changing the world through the message of the grace of Jesus Christ. You can give your year and gifts securely on our website or by downloading the Renolda Church app from your app store. From the bottom of all of our hearts here at Renolda, thank you for your continued faithfulness to the mission of the gospel work here in the triad and throughout the world. If you want to stay in the know and have all this information dropped right in your inbox, use the link below to sign up for our digital newsletter we call The Days Ahead. Again, we are so glad you're here and Merry Christmas. Hi, my name is Chad Foster. I'm an elder here at Renolda Church. My family and I have been attending here for probably close to 20 years or so. We currently attend the Clemens campus. I have three young kids, Emma, William, and James, and a beautiful wife, Erin Foster. I was asked to speak to you today about giving. Uh, it's something that our family considers an essential part of our Christian faith. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that giving should be a joy and not a burden. And David tells us in Chronicles that it is a joy to give. He feels so blessed that he gets the opportunity to give. It is something that is uh, to be celebrated. And so I think that's really my message for giving, is that it should be a joy. We are approaching the end of the year and it's a time to celebrate. And as you give and you look at what makes sense for your family, uh, it should be something that you look back and see it as a participatory event with Christ. And it's something where you can partner with God. He built the whole world. He put the mountains in their place and He doesn't need us to do any of His things. But He gives us the opportunity to join alongside Him and lets us be partners in His plans. There is no greater joy than to get to partner with God in anything. So as you attend the rest of this service and search your heart for what's right for you, we look forward to any contributions that you might like to give. Thank you. First, just want to say welcome to everybody joining us online on our campuses. Uh, and if I haven't met you before by any chance, I'm, I'm Alan Ryan, I'm pastor at Renolda. What a privilege to have been serving at Renolda two and a half decades. 25 years. I started when I was 19, and uh, so I was very young. I was very, I was very young. Um, I want to start this message the way I start every message 
with a question, and it's not a rhetorical question, it's a real question. I'd love to hear your answer. Are you ready for some good news? Yes. The gospel, that is the good news of what God's done in Jesus Christ, the gospel announcement is not an exhortation for you to try to become a, a better person, a better Christian, or a better follower of Christ, or a, a, a more giving person, or a better a better servant. The, the gospel announcement is just that. It is an announcement of good news of great joy. And in that announcement, in that good news, there is power to change everything in your life. As a lover of grace, a lover of the gospel, a lover of thinking about what God's done for us and announcing a pure message of grace. Sometimes, you know, people will wonder, well, if you just preach grace, uh, isn't that going to make people get lazy? They're not going to try as hard to be good Christians. Isn't that maybe going to give them license to sin? And um, it, it, the very question itself reveals how we don't understand the depths of how good this good news is. And I want to show you just briefly from this Christmas story how it really works, how transformation really happens in our lives by the power of the gospel. Because it's exactly what happens to these shepherds. Ooh, Elizabeth read earlier here uh, with us uh, two passages from Luke. And then we stopped after the angels had ascended into heaven. But here's what happened after that good news announcement. Luke 2 verse 15. When the angels went away from them, from the shepherds, into the heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying, that they'd been told concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Let me give you verse 15 again. When the angels went away into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see. The shepherds said, Let's go. And that's the title of my little message. Let's go. God didn't tell these shepherds to go to Bethlehem. Isn't that interesting? The angels did not tell the shepherds that they ought to glorify God more in their lives. The angel didn't tell the shepherds that they ought to be more faithful witnesses and better evangelists. They didn't tell the shepherds that they ought not be lazy, but they ought to be energetic in their faith and witness and life. The angels didn't say any of that. The angels just appear and give this good news of great joy. That's for the shepherds and for all people. And what's, what would be laughable is to think that this great announcement comes unto you this day in the city of David is born a savior, is Christ the Lord. And there's this angelic host, like the heavens are peeled back and this huge army of angelic warriors appears saying glory to God in the highest. It'd be laughable to think that the shepherd's response would be a yawn. <sighs> what y'all want to do now? Well, I don't know. I think it's my turn to take a nap and somebody else watch the sheep. <laughs> yeah, Johnny, will you watch the sheep? And uh, I'll be up in a little bit and take a turn. It'd be, it'd be laughable if one of the shepherds said, Joshua, um, <clears throat> if you got a good story you could tell us, maybe read us a good nighttime tale or something. It'd be ridiculous for one of them to say, you know, I think... That'd be a good time for a little snack, right? Now. The angels of God had just appeared to them and announced that the Messiah had been born for them and for all the world. You can't hear that kind of good news 
and not have something happen. Let's go. So if you're a basketball fan like I am, and uh, your team is behind and you're pulling for them to catch back up, and then somebody on your team just nails a three-pointer and the crowd starts going crazy and you can feel the surge of momentum swinging back towards your team and the camera zooms in on your player who just made the, the three-pointer and you can read his lips. And when it's my team, I'm just praying as they zoom in on him, just don't let it be cuss words right now. And, uh, and, but most of the time when they zoom in, they, they, if there's two words they're going to say, most of the time they're going to say, let's go. And what the basketball player means is not, let's leave this basketball arena and go to some other venue at this point in time. No, what let's go means is let us summon all the energy that we have for the momentum has shifted our way and let us therefore be all that we can be in this moment we have been energized by the good news of a three-point shot that went in so when the shepherd said let's go they were not just saying, let's go to Bethlehem. I think these shepherds are saying, let's go. <laughs> let's go. It's interesting that this word for let's go in Greek has usually the connotation of entering in and often is used of God coming in or it is used to speak of entering into the kingdom of heaven. Interestingly, in Luke's gospel, when Jesus rebukes the legalistic Pharisees, he uses the word there and says, you do not enter in and you keep those people that you teach from entering in. In other words, he was saying your legalism is counteracting the let's go. It's grace that makes us say, let's go. It is good news that energizes our souls and fills us like the shepherds with urgency. We got to go and we got to go now. And the text says the shepherds went in haste. I imagine they ran and they said to one another, the text says, they all go. There's something about that good news announcement that is unifying as it energizes them. And they leave. And what have they gone to do? When they say, let's go, where are they going? What are they doing? They've gone to seek the son of God. Good news, when it is good enough, when gospel breaks through to you, it energizes you to pursue, that is to seek the Son of God. When they say, let's go see this thing that's happened. The word in Greek there is not thing. There's not a word in Greek means thing. It is a beautiful word, rhema. It really means word. It is the kind of word that comes uniquely from God for a unique moment in time that is going to have an effect. Let's go see this word manifest. This is the way it works, beloved, in the Christian faith. God brings revelatory words and that revelatory word, that good news, ignites inside of our own hearts energizing us where we once were not and causes us to reorient ourselves in pursuit of the kingdom of God in pursuit of the very face of God I, I wonder how the shepherds found him the angel said and this will be a sign unto you you'll find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger it didn't say it's in the fourth street on the left when you get to the main intersection of Bethlehem. 
It's a small town. I guess they presumed that if the baby's in a feeding trough, there must be a barn. And I imagine the shepherds running from stable to stable, asking everyone they could see, is there a baby that's been born in a barn? A lot of people think that Christianity is this taking a blind leap of faith that requires some sort of mental gymnastics where you got to shut off your intellect and make yourself think that you really believe in God. And then you, you, you just desperately try to believe and then you desperately try to obey. That's not the way it works. The way it works instead is that God loves you and he reveals himself to you in a thousand different ways. And to each person, it's unique. But he wants you to see him. And he wants you to hear the good news. He wants to hear you to hear of his love and hear of what he's done to come and be a human so he could take your place on the cross and take the penalty that was due to you and to me and to give you by simple trust life forevermore, making you an heir of every spiritual rich thing imaginable. He brings revelatory word to your heart. And from that good news, you run to find him. Even the deepest intellects who come gradually into faith are awakened by an awareness of something glorious beyond all of this. I was reading some this week again about C.S. Lewis and how he came to faith. C.S. Lewis, the famous author of Mere Christianity and of the imaginative Chronicles of Narnia, who was for a long time an atheist. And he eventually came to believe there must be a God but had not come to be a Christian until sometime after a special night in September of 1931 in which a couple of friends had come over for dinner. One of them, you know his name, J.R.R. Tolkien, the famous author of The Lord of the Rings. And after dinner, they went for a walk down by the river. And while they were walking, they began to talk of their mutual love for myths and fairy tales. And C.S. Lewis said that it was those stories, those grand stories of myths and tales of adventure and rescue and glory, those stories, he said, was what he loved the most. And he said, it's, it's unfortunate in a sense that the things that are true are not, not like those big stories. And C.S. Lewis said of the myths, he said, they are, they are breathed with silver, but lies. And Tolkien interrupted and said, oh, no, they're not. He said, Christianity is like one of those fairy tales, but it is true. And the biographer of C.S. Lewis said that the men stopped and held their breath when Tolkien said that. Because what Lewis realized was that everything that he loved that made life beautiful and wonderful was in stories that were beyond the ordinary. And he had assumed that all that was just myth. But the idea that maybe the reason we love those stories is because there is a true story of the transcendent. And soon after, C.S. Lewis became a Christian and changed the world. What I'm saying is that no matter how a person comes to faith, we're all like the shepherds. There is some gift of revelation from God that causes us to seek him with all our hearts. And when you get this kind of good news in your life, you become a whole lot like the shepherds. Well, I don't mean you got to run from barn to barn and you may not be jumping and leaping like they do, but it changes everything. 
You know, Faith Hill's song, A Baby Changes Everything. It really is true. We had been married nearly 10 years before we had our first child. We had waited a long time, and then we had a long time of trying to conceive. And we weren't sure we would have that gift of biological children. And uh, as I've told before, it was my birthday weekend in January, and it was a Sunday night. And I was ready to put my pillow, my head on the pillow. And on Sunday night, when it comes time for me to go to bed, watch out. It's, it's Sunday night for a preacher. And I'm laying there. I am so ready to go to sleep. And my wife said, I'd like you to open one present early. I said, no, no, sweetie, I can't. I said, I, I'm, it's Sunday night. You know, I'm tired. I just, I, I, I'll enjoy all the presents so much more tomorrow. I lay my head down. And she's just sitting there. And she tapped me on. She said, could you just open one? I said, I, I just, I just don't, I can't, I just don't, I can't. I just don't think I can. She said, just one. She begged me. I finally said, all right, okay. And my eyes are half shut. I, I'm almost in a bad mood while I'm opening it. I open up the present and I look and it was some little baby booties. And I looked at her and I said, are you saying? And she said, yeah. And all of a sudden, I was wide awake. <laughs> and I've been wide awake ever since. <laughs> because a baby changes everything. We reprioritized everything in our lives because the announcement of good news that a baby's on the way. We had these pictures that had these angels in them. Anne said, I love those. I wish you'd paint them up in the corners. I spent weeks on a ladder painting angels that look like the ones in these pictures. Two in each corner of the nursery. We started spending our money differently. We started spending our time differently. We changed our whole lives because a baby was coming. But nobody said, hey, you need to change everything now. No, we just found out that this great gift was coming. And so automatically, life changed. The shepherds moved from the fields of Bethlehem to running in wonder and excitement to pursue Christ, to find him, and then returned glorifying God and telling everyone they knew. Because, beloved, Good news, if it's good enough, will change everything. It means if you don't have a passionate desire to pursue Christ or to live a holy life or, or to be an effective witness, for it means that what you need is not more rules but more good news. This Christmas is always let your heart center on the good news of great joy. It will change you. And that's the gospel.
I start every message with a question, are you ready for some good news? I finish every message by saying, and that's the gospel. 
But I'm wondering if I need a third phrase. Let's go. (laughs) Because when you hear it, when you really hear it, the birth of a Savior for you, it changes everything. May the Lord God bless you and keep you and be kind and gracious to you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.